In this video, I'm going to introduce the Coulomb gauge. This video is part of a playlist on electromagnetism. In the previous video, I introduced the Lorentz gauge. And I actually covered a lot of these equations in the previous video. But I'm going to give a quick overview if you haven't seen that video. So these two green equations are a way of expressing the electric and magnetic fields in terms of the scalar and vector potential. So phi and A are the scalar and vector potential. And we actually have freedom to choose these guys. We have freedom to impose conditions on them. Because you can actually find gauge transformations, which are discussed in a previous video, and these gauge transformations allow you to switch in between different phi's and A's. And those different phi's and A's actually correspond to the same electric and magnetic fields. And if you do a gauge transformation, you are guaranteed that the electric and magnetic fields will be the same. You'll still have the same physical experimental results, because this is what the charges uh, in an experiment are going to respond to. They're going to get a force, a nudge, from the electric and the magnetic fields. So that is the property of gauge invariance. It allows us to switch between different values of phi and A. And if we impose a certain condition, that is going to allow us to simplify some equations. So have a look at this blue and this red equation over here. They contain all of the information that is contained in Maxwell's equations. But Maxwell's equations, well, there's four of them. And we have uh, all of them are first order partial differential equations. So what this does is it repackages Maxwell's equations in two separate equations. And these, these two equations are second order differential equations. So they're second order partial differential equations. And they are inhomogeneous because they have source terms. So we actually derive both of these guys in a previous video. So make sure you watch all those derivations so you can see where these equations come from. And another quick little side note, this over here is the D'Alembertian, or the D'Alembert operator. And it is a generalization of the Laplacian to four-dimensional space-time. So this over here is the Laplacian for three-dimensional space. And this is the D'Alembertian, which generalizes the Laplacian to four-dimensional space-time. And we're using a convention uh, that puts a minus sign in front of the temporal component and puts plus signs in front of the spatial components. So that is just a convention. You can switch uh, those uh, minus signs around as long as the temporal and spatial components have opposite sign and you're doing it consistently. That is called the signature of the metric in special relativity. So now let's have a look at the Coulomb gauge. We have all of this background information. What we're going to aim to do with the Coulomb gauge is we're going to try and simplify this blue equation and this red equation. So th these guys are pretty complicated. First of all, they're coupled. So this equation influences this equation, because a and phi appear in both of these equations. So it would be nice to get rid of the dependence. In the previous video where we had the Lorentz gauge, we actually isolated a and isolated phi. We just had a an equation uh, that's actually known as the inhomogeneous wave equation for both a and phi. So we didn't have a and phi mixed together, as we do over here. So how can we get rid of a in this equation? Well, we could set this equal to 0. And that is the Coulomb gauge. The Coulomb gauge says that we have to specify the divergence of A. In the Lorentz gauge, we also specify the divergence of A. But we actually we set it equal to a time derivative of phi with a factor of 1 on c squared. And there's also a minus sign. But over here, what we're going to do is we're going to do a, a much more simple specification. We're just going to set the divergence of A equal to 0. And if we set the divergence of A equal to 0, that's going to make this term disappear. And we, you might actually be familiar with this in the case of statics situations. Sometimes it's convenient to set the divergence of the vector potential equal to 0. And over here, it's very convenient, because it's going to wipe out this term. What we're going to have is just 0 over here, and the partial time derivative of 0 is 0. So what's going to happen to the blue equation? Well, this is what we're going to get. We're going to get the Laplacian. This is the Laplacian operator acting on phi. And this is going to disappear. And that's just going to be equal to minus rho on epsilon naught. And this is actually Poisson's equation. So I'll write that on the side over here. So what we have is Poisson's equation. So Poisson, French guy, and this is his equation. And this is actually quite easy to solve. This is much easier to solve than all of this mess over here. 
So what we have is Poisson's equation, and that is a second order uh, differential equation. So this is a Laplace operator acting on phi. But here's a thing that you have to be very, very careful of. This would imply that changing the charge density has an instantaneous effect on the potential. And it does. But this potential does not unique. The, the, it, you actually, if you know the potential, you don't have enough information to conclude the electric field. You need more information. You need this term over here. You need to know the partial time derivative of A. So in the electrostatics case, we can ignore this because there is no time derivative of A. So this is all that you need. But in the electrodynamics case, you would, if you ignored this term, you would come to conclusions that charges can affect other charges instantaneously. But we know that's impossible. This violates uh, the principles of special relativity. We know that a signal has to travel at a maximum speed of the speed of light. So C, which appears in uh, some of these equations over here, C is over here, that is the maximum speed at which we can uh, send a signal from one point of the universe to, the other, to another point of the universe. So this is a very important nuanced point. If you have the potential, it will instantaneously change if you change the charge density. But the potential doesn't tell you everything. The potential is just one part of the electric field. And the electric field will have a delayed response. So if you move some charges in this part of the universe, then you're going to have to wait until that signal propagates through space and reaches another point in space. And that's when you're going to get a, a, a response to that initial movement of charge. And if you have charges moving backwards and forwards, you're actually going to, you're going to generate electromagnetic waves. And those electromagnetic waves are going to propagate at the speed of light, if this is in a vacuum. They will propagate at a different speed if it's moving in some kind of medium. So this is a very important uh, point to stress on. We're not violating special relativity by looking at this equation. That's because the electric field does not uh, just depend on phi, it also depends on A. So we have to look at this red equation. Let's see what happens to the red equation. So the red equation is still going to have this de Lambertian operator. So we can write that down over here. So we're still going to have the de Lambertian operator, or the de Lambert operator, acting on A. But this is going to get simplified over here. We're going to lose this divergence because we're setting that equal to zero. We're choosing A and phi so that this guy has to be equal to zero. So let's write that out over here. We're going to have minus the gradient of what's left. Well, we have 1 on c squared times the partial time derivative of phi. That's on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we still have the source term, which is minus mu naught times j. And j is the current density. So this is the simplified version of the red equation. It's still a little complicated, because this is actually quite difficult to work out. So finding a is not a trivial task. But finding phi is very easy. So if you're only interested in finding the potential, as is the case in electrostatics, then the Coulomb gauge would actually be very convenient, because you just have to solve the Poisson equation. And this is a relatively easy a partial differential equation to solve. It's not homogeneous. If there was no charge, you would just set this equal to 0, and then it would be homogeneous. But in general, if there is some kind of charge density, this is inhomogeneous. So you're dealing with the inhomogeneous Poisson equation. But down over here, you're dealing with this far more complicated equation. So what you could do is you could solve for phi given rho, and then you could put that phi inside here, and you're also uh, usually given j, so j is all the currents. So you know j, you know phi from this equation up here, indirectly because you know rho, and that can allow you to find A. So once you have A and phi, you can find the electric and magnetic fields. So it is quite, uh, quite a, a complicated story, but it is useful. This is very useful. This framework, this mathematical framework for classical electrodynamics is very useful. It's a lot easier to think in terms of phi and A than in terms of E and B sometimes. So E and B are more physically intuitive to us because these are things that we can interact with in the physical world. But phi and A are mathematically uh, more useful in certain situations. And especially uh, because of this, uh, this property called gauge invariance, where you can select conditions, and you can specify these conditions that A and phi must satisfy. So this over here, this is the Coulomb gauge condition, the divergence of the vector field 
A has to be equal to zero. And it gives us this uh, lovely combination of this blue and red equation. So these are the equations that we get. So this is not necessarily trivial uh, to solve, but this one is uh, a lot easier to solve than what we had up here. So this one, the Poisson's equation, shows up in electrostatics all the time. So what is the scenario that you have in electrostatics? In electrostatics, there are, there are no movements of charge. You're not interested in time evolution. Everything is static. Everything is frozen. So what you have is some kind of charge distribution. And that charge distribution is in 3D space. And that is specified by the scalar function rho. So rho depends on all the spatial coordinates. And in general, it depends on time. But in electrostatics, it's not actually changing with respect to time. So everything is fixed. And in electrostatics, what you're interested in is you want to find the electric field that is a result of the charge distribution. And if you can do that, if you can find the electric field, then you know what would happen if you had a point charge at any point in space. And that is actually the goal over here, because you're, you're looking at what force a charge would experience. So that is the goal of electrostatics. It's to find what, how uh, charges would interact with a static distribution of charge. So you have a bunch of charges over here. How would this charge interact with those charges? And that is where the, the principle of relativity comes into place. If we start moving those charges, and if we move away from electrostatics, we go into electrodynamics, if we start moving those charges around, there will be a delay. And there's always going to be a delay because the maximum speed that that signal can travel is the speed of light. And that delay uh, is taken into account by this term over here. So as soon as you start moving those charges around, you don't have enough information in phi. You need to find A as well, and that will determine the electric field. And that saves us from violating special relativity. We are not moving things instantaneously. We're not sending signals instantaneously, even though if you look at this, it may seem like we're sending signals instantaneously. We're not, because this is not the thing that we're measuring. We're not measuring phi. We're measuring the electric and magnetic field. That, these two are the things that actually influence charges in an experiment. And that's how we measure them. We look at how charges respond to that. And we look at what currents are doing and what charges are doing. So this was a video based on the Coulomb gauge. So hopefully now you understand what uh, the Coulomb gauge can do for us and how it can simplify these two second order partial differential equations and how it can help us find phi and A and then in turn help us find E and B, which is the goal of classical electromagnetism. Because once we know E and B, we know how charges will move, and we also know how currents and charges will behave as a function of time. So make sure you check out the other videos in the Electromagnetism playlist.